Everything we do has an effect and can change even our future. Everyone has a choice and everyone has a voice and uh, we should accept this responsibility. But uh, I think that one needs courage and curiosity to stay on this path, but it's worthwhile. Forwardism. The joy of seeing and feeling tomorrow before it's been created. Continually challenging convention. It's a push for certainty of a better experience when we get there. This is Forwardism. Hi everyone, my name is Yomi Degake and welcome to Forwardism, BMW's new audio series for those who live for tomorrow, today. In this series, I'll be talking to the creative minds creating, shaping and designing our future. Guests will be putting together the pieces to create a picture of the future and defining what forwardism means to them. So who will be coming with us on our journey of forwardism today? Well, today's brilliant guest is the one and only Marie Aigner, architect and designer. Marie is well known for her urban and classical solutions in architecture, interior design, furniture design and product development. She's a bit of a multifunctional. And regarding her approach to design, she says that it should be subject to a product because it is, in contrast to art, not without purpose. I'm looking forward to discussing that with her today. Marie, welcome to today's podcast. How are you? Hi, Naomi. I'm fine. How are you? (laughs) I'm very well, thank you. And thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So for those who might not be across your work, can you tell us a little bit about it in summary? I am educated as an architect. I'm married. I have a 13-year-old son named Oscar. My passport says I'm German, but uh, I spent part of my childhood actually in Switzerland. And... um, I studied architecture in Germany and France and then worked for Richard Meyer and Skid Mowings Merrill in the US. And when I came back, I started my own business for brand design and corporate architecture. I was always involved in research and product design and special for sustainable materials and advanced building systems. And acoustic has become one of my main interests and focal points. Otherwise, I'm a pretty mediocre tennis player, sailor and ski runner. I am a really bad golfer. I'm afraid of horses and lions. Dogs and cats are okay with me. I'm not a vegetarian. I also do some yoga, obviously not enough. Hence, I'm not at all relaxed or even tempered. I, um, I like a lot of music styles, except country and uh, medieval music. And I love my friends and uh, even some family members. Yeah, I think that's pretty everything (laughs) you should know about me. Well, I mean, I think this is one of those instances where the fact is actually more interesting than the fiction. So thank you very much for that, Marie. (laughs) Thank you. You're very well known for your clever and innovative solutions in architecture, interior design, furniture design, product development. That's a lot of different things. Where does your enthusiasm for design come from? Um, A basis for designing of objects or buildings, which are only in my mind, it's only... These are only objects with uh, greater dimensions and perhaps more complexity as the interest in those. So you need to be curious about them. And this curiosity and love is uh, more important than even the talent for drawing. My love uh, for beautiful things or design affinity started already in my early childhood. My grandparents, with whom I spent part of my childhood, had an interesting circle of friends with many artists. And um, there were, for example, sculptures in their garden. And uh, I, myself, as a child, I got a crazy treehouse with colorful flags in the summer. And uh, they traveled a lot. And always when they returned, they brought little treasures with them, like porcelain from Morocco, African art, Asian fabrics, wonderful things for a child. 
And um, there already started my fantasy and my love for beautiful things and my interest in design. And years later, I was uh, a passionate flea market visitor and I spent all my pocket money on everything that was uh, chrome plated or shiny. And uh, at the age of 16, I bought my first painting during a stay in Budapest and I stayed with it overnight in a Ford Fiesta. It was my friend's car because I was really afraid that it might be stolen. And um, if you hear this, then probably everybody thinks, so why didn't Marie become an art dealer? But um, there are a couple of reasons why not, because I didn't want to sell anything of what I, I gathered. And I wanted to become a self-creator and I had to, uh, to study something serious. That's at least uh, what my mom wanted. And therefore, I studied architecture and engineering. And um, that's actually how I became an architect. A very interesting journey. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the concept of forwardism. Um, our podcast is called This Is Forwardism. So what do you think when you hear the term forwardism? How would you describe that concept in your own words? Mm, forwardism for me would mean to push limits, to try uh, something new, to transfer a given knowledge uh, to a new level, to take something out from its box or usual context. Mm -hmm. This could refer to material, to design, to the manufacturing process. I mean, one does not exclude the other, but uh, one does also not condition it either. Thank you so much, Marie. And um, we really wanted to speak to you because we obviously see you as very much someone who is pushing and driving things forward and an example of forwardism. But what would you say, in your opinion, about yourself embodies the concept of forwardism? I always try really to push boundaries and uh, I try out new materials. I develop or apply a new knowledge and I'm very courageous in my design. And um, you've kind of touched on it in the, uh, that answer. Um, but what else would you say drives you forward? Curiosity, ambition. I'm always in the lookout for new trends, ideas, materials, techniques or design. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about your career journey. Um, you first came into contact with the concept of acoustic design in 2006 and um, realised that there were only a handful of visually aesthetic solutions for acoustic absorbent furniture. There were very few solutions for that issue until you actually came along. How did you decide to tackle this problem? Actually, there was no acoustic furniture at all in 2006. And oh, wow badly designed solutions for wall coverings or ceiling panels. We had to work with what material was available. And hence, I rearranged uh, the products in a different and unusual way. And the results were already better than anticipated. Later, I reflected what bothered me about the creations and to change those details like frame, shape, colors. And only after I had understood the materials and existing construction methods, I simply tried out new things and left the well-known rectangular acoustic panel behind me. Actually, I only started the acoustic furniture collection in 2016. Acoustic wow. lamps and objects I had started in 2014, two years earlier. Yeah. Right. And um, as we've kind of mentioned, and as has, you've actually been described as someone who pushes boundaries, making the impossible possible and going against the trend. And that was in a recent article. Would you, in your sort of humble opinion, agree with that sort of um, summary? And would you call yourself pioneering in any way? I certainly detect pioneering spirit with my design. But uh, it's uh, definitely not correct that I'm basically working against a trend. Mm. Sometimes I'm too early ahead of the trend. And uh, acoustic and the circular economy have always been a very important topic and issue for the last five to ten years. And I'm still on it. But um, it's not trendy. So these topics are and will remain important. So it's not right. that I'm against the trend. Yeah, sure. And as someone that we've described as pioneering and, you know, you recognise that pioneering spirit in yourself, what would you say makes somebody a pioneer? And um, can you also name someone that you 
feel is pioneering in your field? A pioneer is uh, someone that uh, develops or applies a new knowledge, a new material, a new design or technique. And um, yeah, at present, we have plenty of them. It's an... Uh, well, now I'm name dropping. It's in, for example, in Elon Musk with PayPal, Tesla, SpaceX, Jeff Bezos, from library to grocery to data storage. Steve Jobs, we don't need to explain. <laughs> Picasso with the Cubism, Fry Otto, Carla Trava, to name uh, some architects. Uh, they developed the free hanging structures. It's, uh, I mean, there are plenty of them. And Nobody is aware of it, what they really did. Mm. Yeah. But they are all pioneers. They were all pretty uh, courageous. Yeah. So we've spoken quite a bit about sound absorbing interior design, and it's incredibly interesting, but some of our listeners might not be as well versed in the topic. So could you please um, explain why it's something that is necessary? Our world is uh, becoming busier and louder every day. Wherever we are, sonar pulses overwhelm us. It's in traffic, in the office, uh, at school, even in hospitals. The big problem with all those sonar pulses and bad acoustics is that it really it affects our health, our productivity, our social behavior, and our learning. And therefore, it is important to control this sound. Definitely. No, very interesting. Um, how would you say... Or what would you say has developed or changed in the field of acoustic design over the past sort of few years? Acoustic design has uh, gained increasing attention to a growing health awareness. A new market was recognized as such and occupied by a vast amount of new companies, which is actually beneficial for the customer since competition promotes uh, the product quality and variety. And um, congratulations, because I know you're publishing a book, Design Solutions for Noise Control, and that will be out in the summer. In the book, you present 40 examples of emerging and established architectural practices from all over the world that deal with acoustically complex situations. And you um, come up with your own original solutions. Um, can you describe what your favourite sort of troubleshooting example for those issues has been? <laughs> yeah, it won't come out in summer. There were some delays with the book due to a pandemic and its side effect. So it will be in autumn either or spring because you only have two fair, two book fairs all year long. And right. uh, we have to place it on one of these uh, fairs. But it's not a problem. I already work on the second. <laughs> oh, <laughs> But in general, what's interesting, I was really able to state that Acoustic planning or noise control has now reached the consciousness of architects and uh, in their implementation, they speak really the same language as they do in their architectural design. So, for example, John Parsons' acoustic solutions are invisible. And if you take a Frank Gehry, they are layered and wild. So only to use a personification for different styles. So that was really interesting. Yeah, definitely. Right. And also exciting to hear that you're working on book number two, pioneering as ever. So how would you say the topic or the conversation around sustainability changed your work and your attitude towards it? Acoustic design has become uh, one of my main topics and uh, therefore this also asks for a lot of time and um, and therefore I concentrated on it and the more you you deal with uh, with the problems and the more you deal with the materials the more you get aware of it and uh, after a while you try out more and more things and uh, in the fields of acoustic I'm now for me it's not that I have to do it meanwhile it's like I dance with the acoustic and uh, mm -hmm. besides on all the other fields in my daily life uh, it's uh, everywhere what I tried to explain to you before in the moment you're aware of the sound right. it's gonna harm you because you be aware of it everywhere and mm -hmm. uh, that happens to me now in my daily life that I be cautious about materials. I be cautious about the sound. So you take it to everywhere. Yeah. 
That's it. And uh, therefore, it's a different way of living. Yeah. And it's also a different way in my works, also in my future works. Uh, as an architect, I will always uh, try out to uh, not only to design the room with uh, the furniture, with the colors, with uh, the framework, but it will be also acoustically well and well chosen materials. Thank you, Mary. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, society is becoming increasingly digitized and um, there's been the development of the metaverse. Um, creative industries are changing to sort of keep up with that. And areas like digital architecture and digital interior design have, you know, over the past few years emerged. To what extent do you think that um, those developments will change the industry? I mean, the metaverse as a three-dimensional, multi-sensory experience uh, creates uh, very interesting technical possibilities uh, to test and uh, improve buildings and commodities for the user in advance before it's built in reality. That will be a major thing. On uh, my opinion, uh, we definitely need to move in this virtual world, but um, I am myself. I speak only about for me. I see it as a tool with a lot of benefits that we should use. I will still be living in the real world. And this uh, second virtual world will exist parallel. And uh, it is uh, something additional. And uh, I don't see it as an offset to reality. Right. It uh, was a blessing in times of COVID, a great advantage for test series, an absolute progress uh, for video conferences and uh, prototype architecture. Um, so it will be a part of our future. Yeah, definitely. So speaking to that future, can you envisage yourself taking part in, you know, metaverse architecture or getting involved in that sort of virtual reality with your work? Uh, why not? <laughs> our creativity cannot be replaced by artificial intelligence. Yeah, That's sure. Yeah. So therefore, there will be a need for us and us, I mean, architects or designers. And I'm I myself, I'm too curious to get uh, past the metaverse. Besides, My. I'm interested in everything that has much to offer mankind and has received little attention so far, like um, intelligent building systems for electricity, heating, cooling, biomimicry, how to copy nature's inventions for intelligent design. There is uh, still a lot of things to research. Yeah. You've spoken a bit about the opportunities that the metaverse and a digitized world um, could present, but do you imagine that there could be any risks um, that it may pose for the design and architecture industries? Yeah, I mean, in addition to the benefits already mentioned, it naturally offers architects the possibility and opportunity to build without constructive or legal restrictions, but right. uh, the missing restrictions in the virtual world are also the risk of it. And um, if we uh, go apart from architecture, cybersecurity applies uh, less to the work of architects than to the many other activities. And uh, central to the concept of uh, the metaverse is the idea that virtual 3D environments that are accessible and interactive in real time, they will become the transformative medium for human engagement. And uh, if they are to become practical, a critical consideration, how to monitor or close the security gaps is uh, inevitable. Yeah, definitely. Um, so as someone who we feel very much embodies the spirit of forwardism, um, what advice would you give to our listeners um, about how they can embody forwardism in their everyday lives. Everything we do has an effect and can change even our future. Everyone has a choice and everyone has a voice and uh, we should accept this responsibility. But uh, I think that one needs courage and curiosity to stay on this path, but it's worthwhile. Yeah. So um, we've already touched on your book that will be out in autumn and that we're all very much looking forward to. But if you had to try and imagine the first sentence of your biography. I always say this is quite a difficult question. <laughs> what would the first sentence of your biography be? Live out loud and design your fantasy or stay curious and courageous. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's really yeah, good. Yeah, the first refers to acoustics and the second refers to my daily work. <laughs> like it, like it a lot. That's a book I'd read. Um, if there was something that you could tell your future self, what would that be? 
I would tell her to believe in her abilities and inspire others to share that ideas. That's, I think, for everyone, the essential point to let the ideas become real. And um, we creative people always need strong partners who can then implement our ideas. Yeah. Very strong advice. So as somebody who is so pioneering in the architecture and interior design space, I'm really interested in what your vision for the future of that space is. I want to get quite specific. How do you imagine the architects of the future in, let's say, 2050, so the near future, will be working? Mm, I think that architecture will exist uh, for as long as humans need shelter from the elements. And what's likely to change is uh, the nature of architecture. We will need to be uh, more flexible about what an architect is and does. Um, it's uh, sure that our planet will be overpopulated and warming. We will have to deal with these problems. We will have to deal with virtual reality, with smart cities, with vertical buildings, with sustainability. We need to find new materials. Uh, we have to invent uh, modular architecture that's flexible because you can move and change the systems or these parts. There will be uh, architectural robots, building robots. Yeah, there are plenty of really new things. I mean, there is now a huge shift. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know whether all architects can deal with it, but uh, there will be plenty of work and plenty of interesting things and a lot of things to do. Thank you so much for painting that picture for me, Marie. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Definitely. It's a pleasure for me. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So guys, today's episode is already over, sadly. But as ever, we will push forward. Stay tuned for our next episode with another exciting creative mind, giving you a sneak peek of what tomorrow might bring. My name's Yomi Adegake, and this is Forward Design.